Hey guys, let me introduce you to Warp 3000. So in set one of Larkana, I was actually on the verge of dropping the game because all I did was grind out around 80 games or so of yellow green aggro during a very early meta where everyone else was playing yellow green aggro. And after just turning cards sideways every game, I thought the game was a bit boring and shallow. But then I stumbled upon Warp's very popular red-purple thread in one of the Discord servers I was in, and I tried out the deck and instantly fell in love with both the archetype and the game. As it turns out, I was just a personality type that wasn't really a fan of aggro decks and was more drawn to control and combo archetypes. Red Purple eventually became an extremely popular archetype, and Warp was one of the early pioneers to really push the idea of playing bigger card lists, like a 67 card list, primarily to target the mirror Red Purple matchups, and I've been a fan of experimenting with bigger deck sizes even more. He's also a part of a competitive sponsor team called Luxury Gaming, and you guys may recall one of his teammates, Lux Ferrante, taking down one of the biggest online tournaments with Red Purple featuring Ursula. And you might also be seeing that list being run in a lot of tournaments now and online ladder. By the way, a quick shout out to Luxury Gaming for branching out to Lorcana. I think it's really cool seeing competitive sponsored teams already looking into Lorcana so early in its stages. Uh, they have a website and a YouTube channel, which I'll link below if you want to check them out. Although right now their Lorcana content isn't too big as the game is so young. And apparently because random YouTubers keep trying to steal their content tech. But it's a channel I'll be keeping an eye out when the competitive scene gets really big. Warp doesn't grind Pixelborn Ladder much as he prefers to keep most of his brews and ideas a bit secretive within his inner circle of teammates. So then, why is he teasing me with this all of a sudden? I don't think he understands that I'm a master spy of tech and a divulger of secrets. Anyways, let's look at the list and see what he's got brewed for us. Okay, we got flutes here. And um, what the heck are some of these choices? Bro, you're playing the wrong Tiana, or the wrong one drop. Also, I didn't even know Yellow had a Gaston. Okay, well, I'm intrigued. Let's give it a spin. Well, I'm sold. I want to make a video on this now. This loudmouth parrot has some stuff he wants to say about this deck. Warp says he'll get back to me on that. So I go ahead and make some slight personal fun adjustments to the deck and grind it out some more. It's no big deal if he wants to hold off on releasing this tech. I'm a patient parrot and it'll save me a lot of time and effort to not make a video so I don't actually care either way. Come on, let me make the video. Alright, well, it's time to whip out the big guns and tap into Miller Brewing Company's negotiation budget. Our company is prepared to offer you one million dollars for the first rights to- Yo guys, by the way, master negotiator here for hire. Let's do a very quick deck tech on this deck. I have made a flute song video before, so I'll just go over the different parts of this deck before we jump into some gameplay. Okay, first of all, the deck doesn't run Queen or Rockstar Stitch Package. And why is that? Because of the evolving state of the meta, and I've repeated this many times on the channel, 3 is the magic willpower in the metagame to avoid getting wrecked by Teeth and Storm Rage on, and Swords to some extent. For this reason, 1-3 Tiana and Prince Eric makes a lot of sense. Warp's original list ran a 4-2 split of Simba Eric's, but I've gone 3-3 three three for testing purposes. The second card I want to address is Robin Hood. I actually have been testing a ton of steel decks with Robin Hood, and I absolutely love him. His stat line at 3 willpower fits perfectly into the meta. And Robin Hood has an amazing curve on turn 2 into turn 3 Storm Rage On to kill basically almost everything relevant on turn 3. Here's another really cool line with Robin Hood against Red Purple. You go turn 1 Cindy and your opponent responds with a turn 1 Olaf. And on turn 2, you play Robin Hood. Now if your opponent uses Teeth on Cindy, you simply kill the Olaf on your turn with Robin Hood and really disrupt his turn 3 tempo as he can no longer Fox Mim here. 
Of course, his biggest problem is uninkability, so I think just playing two makes a lot of sense. Playing only two Robin Hood also gives you better Robin Hood mulligans, as it's really nice to see one in starting hand for turn two, but it really sucks to draw multiples in the opener. So I really like the two of Robin Hood here. He's also fantastic at poking at a beast in steel matchups, and there's a lot of steel in the metagame nowadays. And here we have Gaston. Ariel is one of the most important cards in Steel Song, and some people will argue that Gaston is just a worse version of her, as he gains one strength more at the cost of not being able to search for a song. But being a singer 5 at 3 cost in a deck that runs both Whole New World and Swords is still a crazy good ability, and the extra strength actually becomes relevant in a meta where everything is 3 willpower. Comparing Gaston to Ariel is like comparing a wife to a girlfriend. In the end, the best players are going to have both. Now I'm just joking of course, as someone who spends all day on Pixelborn, I don't actually have to worry about having either one. A card that's fallen out of Steel Song list is Rapunzel, and she's back and better than ever here. Steel is the most played color in Lorcana nowadays, and Rapunzel thrives against Steel. Especially with the recent rise in Green Steel discard, Rapunzel's 5 willpower body and her ability to draw extra cards is insanely good against Steel. Another overlooked interaction with Rapunzel is Tragic Beast. People think about a turn 3 into turn 4 curve with Rapunzel, but one of her strongest interactions is actually her turn 5 turn 6 curve with Tragic Beast. When Tragic Beast lands, it's really hard for people to kill him, so red purple players typically try to throw a teeth and ambitions at him to stop his card draw, and steel players will try to answer Beast with Sword, Tinkerbell, or Smash or something. After an opponent expends their resources to damage Beast, imagine coming right back with a Rapunzel to heal Beast up to full health while drawing off of it and getting a 1-5 quest for 2 body out there. Yellow Steel has a noticeable gap in their 4 drop curve and I think it's about time Rapunzel made a huge comeback. Finally, I've also made some personal adjustments to Warp's list along the way. I am playing one Zero to Hero in this video in place of Tiana because Zero to Hero is just a fun card I like running as a one of in Steel Song, but it's been kind of bad, so I'd probably cut it out again. I also didn't really like World's Greatest Criminal Mind as nowadays I think the most relevant target in the meta is just Cinderella, and I think this card also just gets worse if you're not playing the Queen package to potentially beef up their characters to remove with Criminal Mind. Warp suggested that I play be our guest in that spot, but I kind of like the fact that nothing in our deck will cycle our critical whole new worlds to the bottom. So instead of be our guest, I'm testing out two or three painting the roses red. I feel like there's some potential with painting the roses involving combat with Simba, Eric, or Gaston, and I think it might curve nicely into a potential turn four Rapunzel play. I've also increased my Rapunzel count to three in place of the one Benja. Okay, let's jump into some gameplay with this deck. I've definitely run into some top grandmasters, and the deck has performed extremely well against what I've played so far. Although I couldn't even really show my first three games with the deck, even though I won them, because of how many embarrassing mistakes I made. This deck requires a bit of practice to get the hang of. First game, we're against First to 20, a fellow content creator, and he's playing Red Purple. Warp first sent this list to me telling me that it has a really good matchup into Red Purple and is more consistent than the first iteration of Flute Song. And it's definitely felt very strong into Red Purple in the first few games I've played against it. Here, I think mulliganing away your flutes and drawing into them later game is better, so I opt to keep a Tiana, Eric, and Gaston on the play. We have a whole new world after the mulligan, and since now the deck plays 8 3-drop singers who can sing whole new world, We've set up for a nice turn for a whole new world with Gaston if needed. And since I'm going for an early whole new world, I plan on turn 1 Tiana, turn 2 Flute, and turn 3 Gaston, so I go ahead and ink Prince Eric. He drops a mini and passes. I play a Flute on my turn and I pass. I miss a point of lore by not questing on my turn 2. He takes the typical line of quest with mini and drops snake on turn 2, and passes. On my turn, I have a handful of uninkables, so it's looking like it'll probably be an early wheel line. I ink Strength of a Raging Fire and play Gaston, and I pass. He plays a surfer mini on his turn after questing, and on my turn I draw Beast and I ink him. 
So if I had an Ariel here, I would probably just play Whole New World to dump my pretty crappy hand. But with a Gaston, I decide to sing Swords and trade Tiana for Snake. This opens Gaston to get killed by a Fox Mim on his turn, but because of Gaston's 3 power, he'll actually trade with Fox Mim instead of just straight up dying to it like an Ariel would. And Fox Mim would most likely set him back in tempo by returning the mini to his hand. So as long as I drew an Inkable, I felt like I'd be fine hardcasting a whole new world on my turn on a clean board if he took that line. So I decided to go with Sing Swords here. He plays another Surfer Mini and quests and passes. On my turn, I decide I'll put an Ariel on the board before wheeling. And I see a Swords, but since I'm dumping my hand, I decide not to take it. I want to hit my Ink Drop, so I definitely still want to wheel here instead of Swords. I wheel and play a Cinderella, and of course I also toot the flute for one. He plays a Goat and Olaf and quests in. These minis are a bit obnoxious as they race incredibly fast. Luckily I have an Ariel in my hand to try and find more song removal. I play Ariel Finding Storm and then use it to take out one mini. I draw into Flute and play it and I sing Strength of a Raging Fire to get rid of the second mini. I go ahead and quest in with Gaston as he'll likely be taking out an Ariel with his goat. And if he has a Maui and wants to spend his turn ink on it, I'm okay with that. He takes out my Ariel with a goat as expected, but instead has a crab buff on his Olaf to trade with my Gaston. He finishes his turn by playing a Maleficent. On my turn, I play an Ariel, although I could have definitely gone for a Surfer Stitch, but I wanted to try and find a Swords. I brick, and so I need to whole new world this turn. I go ahead and play out a Gaston to maximize my hand value before singing whole new world, and I trade my small Cindy with his goat. I check his discard pile to see if I've hit any more critical be prepareds, and I did not, but I still decide to play a baby Cindy out anyways. If he wants to clear the board with a B prepared, I'm fine with that, as I'll still have two flutes on board that he can't deal with. He has a very nice turn 7, where he plays Mini, Teeth, and Lady Tremaine to wipe out most of my board. But, luckily, I draw into a Swords to wipe out his board in combination with Storm Rage on. I also play my third flute to get in for 3 lore and tie up the game. I go ahead and play out a Robin Hood as fodder for another potential Lady Tremaine. He has a Maui though for my Gaston. But again, this means he uses his turn ink tempo for Maui and less for lore development. And with my three flutes on board, I should be in a commanding lead in the game. He develops a snake and bounces back his Maui. On my turn, I play Tragic Beast and draw off a cycled Paint the Roses Red, which basically reads, gain three lore, draw a card for two ink, which is just bonkers. I don't mind if he teeths my beast here so I can draw off Rapunzel. But instead he has a Lady Tremaine, and I go ahead and sacrifice my Robin Hood as was his original purpose. I draw 2 off Beast, and then I take out a Snake with Beast so I can draw 3 more off him with Rapunzel. Rapunzel is still an insane card guys. I go ahead and play a Cindy and Strength of a Raging Fire on his Lady Tremaine so I can activate my Flutes. This race against my 3 Flutes is looking extremely bad for him. He plays a Maui taking out Beast and quests in with Tremaine, and his only hope is that I don't have a song in my hand for a lethal on board. But of course I have it with all these cards in hand, and I play Swords, Toot the Flutes, and quest in to end the game.
Flute Song is typically said to have a very good matchup against Red Purple, and this newer version, according to Warp, has a much higher consistency against Red Purple, since it takes out a lot of its weaknesses in the 2 willpower department early game, and it has basically double the Aerials for quick wheels. So yeah, between this deck and the Green Steel deck I covered last video, it looks like there's a lot of emerging decks in the meta that can dethrone Red Purple from the top. So for all the anti-Red Purple players out there, never give up hope. And speaking of green discard, our next game is against the discard king himself, Zero Skater. Now if you watched my last video, you might recall that Skater actually has a positive win rate into Yellow Steel overall. But I think with my extra 4 Gastons to sing a whole new world or swords against green steel, I feel like this matchup is actually back to being pretty heavily favored for Flute Song. It also helps that due to a recent Pixelborn update that lets you see your opponent name during the mulligan, I know to keep a Swords in my hand against Skater to try and control his Bucky and Johns early. With that in mind, here I decide to keep a Swords I wouldn't normally keep, as well as the turn 3 whole new world package. I decide to keep the rest of my Inkables for Ink, so I pitch Robin Hood as I don't want to mulligan into more uninkables. He's on the play, which is very dangerous for me, regardless of having Ariel Swords, so I want to keep the whole new world in case I need a oh crap reset button. Unfortunately, I mulligan into something worse than Robin Hood here as I get a flute, so hopefully my ink works out for me this game. He inks baby Tinkerbell and passes, and I draw into another uninkable whole new world here, so my hand is getting really dangerous. Maybe I shouldn't have kept that whole new world in my opener. I think a lot of players might play the Cinderella on turn 1, but recognizing that you're against steel, and especially discard, Cinderella is quite useless here, and much better as ink in this spot. I think playing Cindy on turn 1 might lose a lot of players the game here, especially given the uninkable count. Skater gets a Bucky out on his turn 2. I draw another uninkable, so this is one of the worst draw sequences I could get for this hand. I ink Strength, as that card is pretty useless against Discard's Ward early on, and play out my Robin Hood. He plays a John on turn 3, and turn 4 is where the pain is about to start. I play Ariel of course, and I'd like to hit something just since I'd like extra cards against discard, but I whiff. I also inked Rapunzel this turn, but I think inking Beast is better, as I do have a line with Robin Hood hitting my Ariel on my next turn to try and draw off Rapunzel. He does have his ideal turn 2-3-4 Bucky John Jafar line, and we pitch a whole new world. So I have a pretty interesting decision on this turn here. Of course I sing Swords to clear out his Bucky and John. I decide I didn't want his Jafar to kill my Ariel, so I cast Strength of a Raging Fire to get rid of him. And then I decide I'm not going to ink this turn. If I ink Beast, I expose myself to Hypnotize and Sudden Chill, or double Sudden Chill. And I need to protect my whole new world here. I think if I can sing whole new world next turn, even if I'm behind a full 2 turns on tempo, because I cleared out his Bucky John engine, I feel like the match would still be fine for me. But I would feel really bad if he stripped my whole new world on his turn, especially given that I had already discarded one. On his turn, he plays double mouse armor after inking Hypnotize. I actually know his entire list since I just covered his deck, and I know he plays exactly 2 mouse armor in his deck list instead of fire the cannons, so it's really annoying that he got both armors against me. Since he did ink the Hypnotize last turn, I decide I'm safe from a double discard play on his turn, as I also know his list doesn't run Lucifers. I decide to be super greedy here and try for a beast whole new world setup next turn, but I think this is a bit of a gamble and it's probably better to just play flute and sing whole new world. But what can I say, I like to gamble sometimes. He plays a beast and protects it from damage with double mouse armor. He didn't ink on his turn, so his hand is likely double swords or a combination of sword Flynn Rider or Prince John. Either way, I need to wheel next turn no matter what. I draw a Tiana and play out my beast and we finally get our wheel off. I go ahead and quest with Robin Hood. I don't think he'll risk exerting his beast to kill my Robin. 
He goes ahead and plays a Tinkerbell to disable my beast, and then armors both his Tinkerbell and beast to protect it against my own Tinkerbell. This is smart, as I've used the swords, but in his mind, I still have four live Tinkerbells in the deck. I sing swords with Ariel to disable his beast. Since my Ariel is exerted here, I decide I might as well quest in with my Robin Hood. But I think this is not good as damaging my own beast to draw two off my Rapunzel is probably a better line. This is why I really like both Robin Hood and Rapunzel together in this deck as I think there's a lot of synergy between those two cards as well, despite me overlooking that play in this moment. I'm still new to this deck list and you guys can just learn from my mistakes. And speaking of mistakes, originally I was going to play out a Simba and sing Strength with Beast to take out Tinkerbell. But at the very last moment, I decided I didn't want to allow his beast to trade for mine, but this is just clearly wrong. So two mistakes in one turn. Whoops. On his turn, he smashes Rapunzel and takes Ariel out with Tinkerbell, killing Rapunzel as well. Then he smashes my beast and sings strength with his beast. He armors both his characters again and passes his turn. On my turn, I decided my surfer has better value than beast, and I wanted to keep strength in my hand, so I ink beast and play surfer and pass. He plays a Bucky and a beast, getting the discard trigger off Bucky. He then armors his Bucky and Beast, trying to protect against Tinkerbell. But unlucky for him, I've actually not drawn any of my Tinkerbells this game, but I've drawn all of my swords. I have a really nasty turn when I sing swords with Surfer Stitch, hit the Tinkerbell for one with Robin Hood, and then finish off his first Beast with a Storm Rage on, while also playing Flute to toot for two more lore. I quest in with Simba to protect my Stitch or Robin Hood from Beast. He plays another Beast on his turn and Prince John and double armors his Beast. Knowing that since I played three of my swords, I probably just have a Tinkerbell and not another sword. But of course, unfortunately for him, I have my final swords to get rid of his John. I play another eight toughness Surfer Stitch and this game should be in the bag for me at this point. With my two surfer stitches and two flutes, I have lethal on board with a song in my hand, and the game ends soon after. So definitely a few misplays on my end this game, but I think this deck should be pretty favorable in general against discard decks. Our third game is against Lorcana decklists. This guy usually finishes each season rank 1 on top of ladder, and I've never seen him pilot anything but hyper aggro decks, as they usually end games very quickly, and so he can pump out a ton of games on the ladder climb. That being said, he plays those decks extremely well, and it'll be great practice to play against a strong hyper aggro pilot. He's always on red purple or yellow purple hyper aggro, and since we know we're up against him, we can mulligan accordingly. I like this new change on Pixelborn since it sometimes emulates best of three tournament formats where you have to mulligan differently on games two and three against your opponents if you know their decks. So I guess it might also make for some good informative content on mulligans in that regard. Here I'll be holding on to Tiana, Robin Hood, and Simba for Ink, as well as my two damage spells to control his board. Whole new world won't be as useful against a hyper aggro deck, and I could probably also keep the stitch for Ink. But I decide to toss it away and I regret it as I mulligan into the worst possible mulligan as a non-inkable flute and a whole new world. Steel Song typically has an amazing matchup against Hyper Aggro, but we are going second this game and our mulligan was pretty awful, so let's see how this goes. He inks Maleficent and plays Lilo, so he's on yellow purple today. I ink Simba and play Tiana and pass. Luckily, he doesn't have his turn to Simba and just plays Pinocchio and passes. I ink Strength and play Robin Hood, a card that's pretty devastating against Hyper Aggro's 1-1s. I pass as I don't want my Tiana to run into a Foxman. He plays Arthur and quests with Lilo and Pinocchio, as they'll eventually be picked off by Robin Hood anyways. On my turn, I continue to get ink screwed, but at least it's another Robin Hood. 
I take out his Pinocchio with Tiana, and I decide to play Storm Rage on and snipe his Arthur with Robin Hood, as I consider Arthur a much bigger threat than Lilo. I draw another uninkable whole new world. He plays a rabbit and quests in with Lilo. I get my 8th uninkable card, and yet somehow I'm still hanging in there. I decide to take out his rabbit with another Robin Hood storm snipe and take out his Lilo with Tiana. I draw an inkable beast off the storm and I ink him. He goes ahead and plays Arthur and Simba. I play a second Robin Hood and a flute after inking Stitch, as I really don't have another good play on my turn. I set up one damage on his Arthur, and if he has a fox, then so be it. But instead he plays Pinocchio, which he bounces with Arthur, and then plays a second Arthur after questing. On my turn, I draw my ninth uninkable in the game, but fortunately it's a beautiful grab your swords. With this, I can wipe out his board in tandem with my Robin Hood. He goes Snake and Pinocchio and passes without inking. I draw my 10th uninkable of the game and I go ahead and drop two flutes down onto the board. I quest in with Tiana. He plays a Maleficent and quests in with Snake. I finally draw something other than uninkables that I can play and plop down an emo beast. With a beast active and ready to potentially whole new world, I decided I would do something super reckless and take down his Maleficent with my two Robin Hoods, exposing them to Fox Mim or Snake Mim. But I knew he didn't have Fox Mim in hand the turns before, so unless he drew into it, I felt okay about the play. But honestly, this play is probably too high risk to prevent the one or two lower points. It seems he did draw into the Fox Mim, and he punishes me to the max by wiping out my Robin Hoods with the Snake Fox combo. I draw two cards from Beast, and I ink Gaston and play a Tinkerbell. With both the Beast and Tinkerbell on board, I feel all set up to pump out the Flute Aggression, so I go ahead and sing A Whole New World. He plays Arthur Fox on his turn after questing. I play an Ariel on my turn and find a Storm. I take out his Arthur with Storm and Swords. Then I quest in and take the lore lead with my flutes. Yellow Purple Hyper Aggro has a very poor mid to late game. Uh, you could actually say it basically has no end game, especially against Steel. And he's not close enough to lethal lore here, so this game should be over. Flute Song has an incredible matchup against Hyper Aggro, and despite going second with a really awful string of uninkable draws against one of the strongest Hyper Aggro pilots on ladder, I still managed to snatch a win with this deck. So a funny thing is I actually also ran into Luxury Gaming's Ferrante on ladder twice with this deck and he happened to be my second loss. We split two games one to one and he was piloting a really funky green purple discard brew which I won't cover because I think it'd be impolite to expose potentially two of Luxury Gaming's secret deck techs in one video. But yeah, once again shout out to Warp and his team Luxury Gaming for sending me this spicy flute list. It's got an amazing matchup against red purple, discard decks, and hyper aggro. I didn't run into any blue steel during my testing, but I would assume it would struggle the most against that deck. Red blue popsicles is probably another deck that this deck would struggle against, although it would probably perform better than the typical steel song list, as flutes are capable of racing very well as long as they don't find an answer to it. I really like this deck, and it's probably going to be in my top 3 choices of decks I would run if I went to a tournament, so I suggest you guys take it out for a spin. I think the deck has a lot of decisions, especially in the mulligan, that can make or break your games. But once you get good at piloting this deck, 
I think you'll find some very good results with it against the meta.